I think in last video we didn't discuss about the agonist and antagonist for um, muscarinic receptors. So let's have M1, M2, and M3. One way to remember the agonist for uh, muscarinic receptor is remember ox, met, and that. Or you can just simply remember oh my bum, right? So if we have agonist and if you're talking about m1 remember ox and ox stands for oxotremorin and about m2 remember met met stands for methacholine m3 for the tannic oil right so ox met and bet for muscarinic agonist and about antagonist uh, for the m1 we have pyrenzepine or telenzepine about m2 you can remember a meth's friend that is methoctramine or tripitramine and about m3 you can remember beth's friend they are solda right solda and sol stands for solifenacine and dar stands for darifenacine right so these are agonist and antagonist for uh, muscarinic receptor once again remember ox meth death or oh my bum so you'll remember oxotremorin methacholine and bethanicol and you can remember uh, about antagonist uh, for m1 is pyrenzepine for m2 it they are meth's friend methoctramine and tripitramine they both sound alike and about m3 remember solder and sol stands for solifenacine and dar stands for darifenacine now let's talk about the cholinergic drug cholinergic drug um, broadly they are classified under two directly acting and indirectly acting cholinergic drug directly acting cholinergic drug means they directly act on the receptors and indirectly acting cholinergic drugs means uh, they are working on uh, anticholinesterases so if they inhibit the anticholinesterase so they would indirectly enhance the level of acetylcholine in the blood right so in the directly acting cholinergic drug again you have cholinesters and alkaloids alkaloids means that they are obtained from plant products right so both the choline esters they are first of all the main drug is of course acetylcholine of course it is a choline ester and it is a directly acting cholinergic drug next drug is methacholine it is m2 agonist another is carbacol and the last one is bethanicol it is m3 agonist right about the alkaloids first drug is muscarine the second one is pilocarpine and third one is aracholine but not of much importance in fact any of the cholinesters are not of much importance because they are not widely used because of better drug availability and i will talk in brief about each of these cholinesters one by one and of course about the indirectly acting uh, drugs they are inhibiting cholinesterase so they are also called anticholinesterase and we'll have a separate video for indirectly acting cholinergic drugs now let's talk about first of all acetyl Choline. We have had a lot of discussion about acetylcholine as a prototype and how it brings about changes in the body. But uh, the main thing is it can stimulate both muscarinic and nicotinic receptor, both, right? And another main important thing is acetylcholine is never injected intravenously, right? Because uh, it is destroyed rapidly its half-life is around maybe 5 to 30 seconds only right if you give intravenous so IV route is not preferred at all and why it is not preferred because it is rapidly destroyed by pseudocholinesterase also called butyryl cholinesterase 
Deuteralcholine esterase is obviously found in plasma and that destroys acetylcholine rapidly. And another reason why we don't give because it works diffusely, it can stimulate both muscarinic as well as nicotinic receptors. So it may bring about so transiently because it is working for very short time. So it can bring about sweating, salivation, lacrimation, bradycardia, abdominal cramp, all the muscarinic and nicotinic action. And by stimulating NM junction, it can bring about muscle twitches. So it has very diffuse action, and that is why we don't give acetylcholine and it is not available as well. The next drug which we shall talk about is bethanicol and the way which i remember bethanicol is that activates bowels and bladder this is very nasty statement and it reminds me of bowel right it is obviously a stomach and a bladder right so beth activates bowel and bladder it's a uh, the main use is for post-operative uh, urinary retention or postpartum urinary retention to evacuate the bladder. Bethanicol is an uh, N3 agonist which we had discussed, ox, meth and beth. It is N3 agonist. So its main action would be N3 specific. It would not give uh, nicotinic receptors induced side effects. So it would not uh, give side effects which would uh, deal with the nicotinic receptors and it is specific N3 receptor and if we talk about the use of bethanicol the first use is it is used in post operative urinary retention or postpartum urinary retention provided that the patient doesn't have any obstruction right if this is urinary bladder and this is urethra if there is any obstruction you cannot give bethanicol because it is m3 selective so it would stimulate the bladder and it would induce contraction so that bladder is contracted and the trigon is relaxed and the sphincter is relaxed it would uh, induce more force on the organic obstruction and it may precipitate severe pain so if you have a patient with benign porostatic hypertrophy do not give bethanicol it would uh, create several other complications so first thing is that you cannot give an, any any sort of urinary urinary obstruction you cannot give this an urinary obstruction and of course it would create uh, all other muscarinic side effects like flushing and sweating and lacrimation and bradycardia abdominal cramps and these are all side effects of bethanicol and this is also some use in uh, post operatively a dynamic ileus this is post-operative condition where the gastrointestinal tract loses its motility so it's to stimulate gastrointestinal tract and of course the urinary bladder you can give the bethanicol it is available generally as 25 milligram tablet now there are uh, there are some contraindications of bethanicol, give bethanicol to the person having peptic ulcers because if you give bethanicol it is m3 specific and m3 stimulates the gastric glands and it would secrete more acid so it is again troublesome for people having peptic ulcers you cannot give to the patient having chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases because uh, bronchoconstriction takes place mediated by m3 receptor you cannot give to the patients who are having ischemic heart diseases because M3 mediated vasodilation leads to severe hypotension. Another thing is you cannot give to the patient uh, who are having hyperthyroid. Hypothyroid. Now this is very interesting. Uh, one thing uh, about the action of the acetylcholine towards the heart is that acetylcholine works on the m2 receptor which are present um, on the heart and the atrias and the SNOs and the 
every node less amount of m2 receptor is pre are present on the ventricle so m2 receptors on the atria obviously works by g uh, inhibitory and it would finally stimulate the um, potassium channel to open up and have open up and potassium efflux would be taking place and and of course potassium efflux would be taking place by the poor beta and gamma friends which we had discussed in the intracellular mechanisms so this hyperpolarization which is taking place in the um, atrial myofibrils would lead to negative chronotropic effect and, and this is um, compensated by opening of a sodium channel right so sodium channel is open now you might think that uh, once it is uh, hyperpolarizing it is uh, opening the potassium channel so there is a hyperpolarization and it is stimulating again sodium channel by a reflex so the main work of the acetylcholine is achieved by opening up of uh, potassium channel so hyperpolarization takes place and there will be negative chronotromic effect but reflexly they open up the sodium channel so at the top they'll have a more consistent depolarization and more amount of work will be there in atrial fibers so instead of bradycardia they'll have tachycardia this is one of the most important uh, effect of acetylcholine in the heart especially in the atrial fibers that is instead of bradycardia it produces tachycardia so if a patient is having atrial say uh, tachycardia and if you give acetylcholine the patient might have atrial flutter right so that is why it is contraindicated in hyperthyroid it is also contraindicated in parkinsonism because in parkinsonism what we have is decreased dopaminergic activity and more of un compensated increased acetylcholine activity or cholinergic activity and and because of this more and more cholinergic activity the patient is having tremors and at the top you give a bethanicol or any cholinergic drug it would induce more tremors so it is contraindicated in parkinsonism as well so you give don't uh, you don't give a bethanicol to the person in peptic ulcer it would give more uh, ulceration not to copd because of bronchospasm not to ischemic heart disease because of vasodilation not to hyperthyroid because of atrial tachycardia and not to parkinsonism because uncompensated acetylcholine activity overshoot